All right, I'd like to call the uh, April 2024 ZBA meeting to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Matt Kaiser. Present. Brad Fredette. Present. Ken Hilton. Present. Keith Perkins. Here. Richard Brooks. Present. Anthony Jones. Present. All right. We'll have to uh, appoint a, uh, a member. Who was at the last January meeting? Anybody? Either one. Mr. Hilton, Mr. Jones, either preference? Mr. Jones will point you as the, uh, a voting member. I accept. Okay. There we go. First order of business is approval of minutes of the meeting of January 3rd, 2024. I'll let you know that we've made a slight change to it on page five of six after the second line where it says Kaiser asked about a distance between the two proposed freestanding signs. We've added Harvey stated that he is unsure about the proposed distance between the signs. He just answered the question. Any other comment? Mr. Brooks? I got one more amendment. Um, that same page uh, further down my, my last comment before the motion was made, <clears throat> I, I had noted that you know, we should be basing the variance on the current ordinance, not the assumed or potential changes that may be coming forward in the future. Okay, and that's totally missing. Yeah, that okay. just was yep. not there at all. That's fine. All right. Anything else? Any other comments, N notes? Okay. Mr. Fredette? I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes as amended. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second by Mr. Perkins. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. You're Should I abstain? I'll yep. <laughs> yep. No, it's fine. Okay. Mr. Jones abstains. He was not here. All right. Moving on to old business. Any old business that comes before the board? Ms. Crosley? No. Any old business from board members? Seeing none, we'll move on to new business. Three Alpha. John Flatley is seeking an appeal for administrative decision of the code of, of the code compliance officer, dated January 31st, 2024, to remove the off-premise sign from the intersection of Tri City Road and High Street associated with the property located <coughs> at 1 through 9 Tri City Road in the Business B District, Assessor's Map 39, Lot 2, ZBA Case 01 2024. There is a public hearing. I'll open the public hearing. Ms. Crosley. Okay. Um, as mentioned, the applicant is appealing the notice of violation that was issued on January 31st, 2024 by Shane Conlon, Code Compliance Officer, regarding a sign for property known as 1 through 9 Tri-City Road that indicated the sign violates two provisions of the City of Summersworth Zoning Ordinance, Sections 19.20.C.1 and 19.20.C.2, and requiring the applicant to remove the off-premise sign from the intersection of the Tri-City Road and High Street. Applicant is appealing on appealing based on that there was an alleged error in order, requirement, decision, or determination made by the administrative official in enforcement of the City of Summersworth Zoning Ordinance. Applicant believes this off-premise signage is a pre-existing non-conforming use. We've provided some information regarding different definitions from the sign ordinance. Um, and the applicant has provided their full application. Uh, I can go over any specific history or ordinance information if you'd like, or um, we have our co-compliance officer here today that can speak during the public comment as well um, in regards to any decision making, whichever the board is looking for best. All right, any questions for Ms. Crosley right now? Okay. The applicant, please come forward and state why we should grant the appeal. Right there. The mic should be on. The green light on. That sounds like it's, it's on. The green light on the pedestal. Yep, it's on. Uh, good state evening. Your name and Yes, good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Eli Leno. I'm an attorney with Bernstein Schur. I'm joined tonight by Kevin Walker of the John Flatley Companies. Um, we don't disagree with Mr. Conlon's determination that this is an off-site sign, off-premises sign. However, as you've seen from the record that we submitted to you, this was adjudicated in 1993. There was a prior code enforcement officer looking into if this sign predated the 19, I believe, 87 adoption of the zone, the <coughs> sign ordinance in your zoning ordinance. And 
while I wish that the end of what had been concluded there was, yes, this is okay, everything is good, the trail sort of went cold in 1993 from the documents that we've been provided as to that final determination. However, as you as a zoning board know, New Hampshire law prefers finality. That's why we have Fisher versus Dover. You can't come back with the same things over and over again. So 1993, it wasn't determined that we needed to remove this sign. And then 30 years have passed. We've carried on. We've made minor changes to this sign in terms of the content, um, change of the apartment unit names, et cetera, added a couple things that are all content related have never lapsed, have never removed this sign, have never moved this more than inches replacing poles. This has been fundamentally in the same spot, doing the same thing for the intervening 30 years since that 1993 decision. I think one thing that's particularly telling about the fact that the town previously accepted that this sign was in the right spot was that in 2012, we went back to the sign review committee and had a, a sign reviewed, at which point it was accepted again. So I think in 2012, nearly 20 years after the 1993 piece, if they'd said, hey, this is an illegal sign, you need to take this down, we probably still would have had reasonably strong arguments. We've now gone through multiple steps, had this reviewed definitively. We have a vested right to have this sign on the property. And certainly I've now had an opportunity to read the property owner's comment letter about this. Nearly everything presented in there goes to the content of the sign. We are, again, willing to work with them, willing to work with the town, willing to go back to sign review committee if they want. They seem to not like the red. If it's that we, we reduce the amount of red, change it back to the blue that they seemed happier with. We're reasonable people. We're here third on the agenda talking about off-premises signs. We're trying to comply with the rules of this town, uh, being good corporate citizens. We're willing to work on all those things, but we do now have a constitutional right to have this vested sign and any determination between the owner and us about that is certainly not within the relatively limited jurisdiction of the ZBA under 674.33. So um, certainly as a lawyer, happy to talk all night, but I think it probably makes more sense for me to answer questions if there may be any or uh, certainly reference the documents I've filed and, and incorporate those as part of my testimony. Okay. Okay. Um, for that, so what we'll do is, uh, is there any, find out if there's any abutters who would like to speak either for or against, and then we'll open up the floor for the, uh, the board to ask any questions. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Any abutters that would like to speak either for or against, or any, or any, or, you all set? Could I speak as a representative of the city? Yes, you may. Abutters or interested parties. All right, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Shane Conlon here of the City of Summersworth, I'm the co-compliance officer that initiated this case. And um, I'm sure you guys have had time to look through the packet that's been provided to you um, but if time allows, I'd like to go through some of those details just to walk you through the process of why we're here today. Sure. Um, but first, before I start this, I would just like to hand out, in the event you guys don't have it. Sorry. Ordinance regarding non-conforming signs. Okay, why don't you wait one? You guys speaking to the mic? Sorry, when sure. you this, so I'll just... Thank you. So it gets properly recorded and documented. <clears throat> All right, so I hope you guys have had a moment to look at the case timeline and summary that's been provided for you. It's pretty lengthy, and I won't go through the entire content, but I would like to discuss some of the exhibits that have been provided. Um, in reference to the exhibit, um, exhibit A, we see here the original sign 
permit application that was filed in 1993. At that time, the permit was never approved. At that point in time, there was probably, let's see, several months of correspondence between the city and the, def I don't want to call them the defendant, but the landowner, applicant. Um, applicant, thank you, sir. In this case, the, at the time, planning director and co-compliance officer uh, went back and forth. You'll see an exhibit B through I. I'm not going to go through each one, but um, the bulk of exhibit B and I is basically just the go between between the two parties um, discussing whether or not it's a pre existing structure. If we move on to exhibit J, and let me know if I'm going too fast. If you look at Exhibit J, as the applicant indicated, there was a sign permit application from 2012. That sign permit application had two different signs on the application. One for the current site, where Terra Meadows currently sits, as well as the sign on High Street that's up for debate this evening. If you flip to Exhibit K, you'll notice that there's a map. There's actually two maps. You'll look at lot 39-2. That's the lot that was indicated in the sign permit application for both of those signs. However, the second sign, the sign up for debate tonight, was placed adjacent to lot 40-4. At that time, the sign was placed in the city right away. And if you guys look at the map provided in your packets, there's two surveys. There's a survey showing the existing sign before the construction that took place on Tri-City Road. That sign was previously in the city's right of way, and as a result of that construction, the sign was then moved into lot 40-4. So not only has the sign been moved, and it's not just a few inches, in your packets I provided satellite imagery showing the measured distance that the sign was moved. If you look at the first aerial photo, and I just want to make sure that you guys have that. Do you have these aerial photos? Okay. The sign wasn't just moved a few inches. Not only was it moved from the city's right of way, which still is not allowed by the sign ordinance, but it was also moved into the abutting property that's privately owned. Um, those maps show that the sign was moved approximately 10 feet. So we're not talking about a few inches here. We're talking, you know, a considerable distance. And if you flip back to this page that I provided you guys, under 19 dash, uh, excuse me, 1920 C8, loss of legal nonconformity, you'll see listed there under AI, the sign is removed and relocated to a different portion of the premises. Not as only moved in a different location, it's on an entirely different premises from a previously city owned property to a property that's now privately owned. Um, and then if you look at the line item before that, AAII, the sign is altered in any manner which increases its nonconformity. If you look at exhibit you give me one moment, please. Exhibit O, which is the notice of violation. If you flip to page three of four of my notice of violation, you'll see two photographs. The photograph on the top was taken, I believe, in 2012. And the photograph below was taken last year. And it's since changed, increasing nonconformity by adding additional businesses. So if we go back and reference the sign regulations, it continues to show that the loss of nonconformity has increased not only through the movement of the sign, but also the increase in businesses. At the moment, there's two separate signs, one sign covering two locations, the Terra Meadows apartments and the Thomas apartments and the new storage units that 
are currently in the uh, town of Rollinsford. And uh, that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And does anybody have any questions for me? We'll get back. Okay. We'll get back. Thank you. Ms. Crosley? Yes. Um, we did receive one written correspondence for public comment. Um, this was submitted by Jackie Lawson, an employee of Dumais, Furland, and Fuller CPAs located at 472 High Street in Summersworth. They also provided photos that have been provided to the applicant and all the board members. Um, she, the photos are of signs, of the sign um, at the property. Um, and she states in this letter, we were told that the sign in question was on city property when we moved into our current location. Now we have found out it is on Dumais and Furland Realty property and the owners did, do not wish for the sign to remain. The new sign is not a replacement of the previous sign. It is not in the same place, not the same size or shape, not the same color, and does not contain the same information or advertise the same company. It advertises three companies. It is a new installation with new information. The previous sign advertised one company, and the new sign advertises three companies. One of them is for the Rollins, Rollins Ford self-storage, which you can't even find a website for on Google. The new sign says, now leasing, on top, which makes it look like our building is for lease. The old sign had an arrow pointing down the street. The new sign has no arrow, and even more people are stopping into our building, wasting our time, trying to rent apartments or storage from us. The old sign was blue, the new sign is bright red. Not tasteful and blocks our sign from down and across the street. It is also very close to the stop sign. It is misleading as to what our property is and detrimental to our business. Rollinsford Self Storage and the Thomas Apartments are, ne are new additions to the sign. The phone is different, there, are, there is an additional website, so even the amount of information has changed. I don't believe the Flatley Company has any standing to appeal when the sign is unpermitted the erect and erected on property that does not belong to them. I also believe that the change in the sign is so significant that it bears no resemblance to the original sign, and any discussion about the history of the sign is irrelevant because it is substantially a new sign with new information. I would or urge the board to deny the appeal and uphold the decision of the Code Compliance Officer to have the sign removed. I apologize for being unable to attend the rescheduled meeting in person. Unfortunately, everyone at our office plans vacations months in advance and for the end of tax season, and the timing of this meeting fell right into that time block when I am away. Thank you for hearing my remarks. Okay. That was from Jackie Lawson, who was basically submitting this on behalf of Dumas, Ferland, and Fuller. Correct. Okay. You'll, you'll be doing it in just one minute. All right. So, that, any other comments by concerned parties or abutters? Okay. Come on up. Back up. Um, again, I'm sure you've read the memorandum I provided with this, but I draw your attention to the L. Grossman and Sons, Inc. versus Town of Guilford case where a town ordered the removal of a sign which did not create health or safety hazards, did not constitute a nuisance, and did not otherwise appreciably affect the neighborhood. The town claimed it had a right to remove this under its local zoning ordinance, and New Hampshire's Supreme Court found that without compensation, removing this sign is a taking. We have an ordinance here that has very tight constraints on what you can do, and then you allegedly lose your grandfathered status, which certainly don't seem like a re reasonable reading that if you replace the posts, you lose the opportunity to have your sign. That promotes the idea that we'd have decrepit signs forever or risk losing them, which seems like it's against public policy. And then the other case I cited is a, a United States Supreme Court case. It's the Reed versus Town of Gilbert case which basically in short says that because of First Amendment protections, if a code compliance officer has to read the sign to know it's not compliant, it's, it's 
um, a content-based restriction. So in both the comments that we've heard from the abutters letter or the, the lot owners letter, as well as from Mr. Conlon, it's that it went from two, sign, two properties to three. It's clearly a content, content based restriction. It didn't become more non-conforming. It's still an off premises sign advertising a different location. So that really doesn't hold water in terms of constitutional muster to be able to say you can't change the sign text. That's um, an overly restrictive reading of the local ordinance in light of federal and state law. Okay. Thank you. Stay up there. Yes, sir. Questions from the board? Mr. Fredette. Yeah, Mr. Brooks. can you provide me with what the dimensions of the old sign were versus the dimensions of the new sign? Um, right, the dimensions are there. Yeah. And what are the dimensions of the new one? Um, so just for my clarity, what what old sign? What is the old the, sign? The sign, or sign or that sign? that was grandfathered in that was because they're making a claim that they have. So the sign that was I understand what they're doing. So there's the, you, so you're asking the dimensions of the sign that existed prior to or at 1987, and the sign that exists today. Well, the correct because just want to be clear so we, we get the right answer. Yeah. Okay. I apologize. I don't have the, the 1993 or 1980s sign dimensions. Kevin, do you have those with you? One more question. Did you submit a permit application and go to sign review when the sign was replaced from the blue sign to the current sign? I believe so, right? I don't believe so. No. And a question for, I'm sorry, for Ms. Crosley. Normally when a sign is replaced, should the person changing the sign be applying and going through the process? Yes, we require a sign permit for a replacement of a sign or a new sign. Um, the only time that it would have not required a permit is for if they had painted it, perhaps. Um, that is under exemption. Okay, thank you. I would... If, if I may, I sure, mean, go to, ahead. certainly don't want to interrupt the chair, but we are certainly willing to go back to the sign review committee if that is something that would be the pleasure of the board here. Okay. Mr. Brooks. So I understand the content based argument that you are making on this, um, but also as I read 1920 C8AIII, uh, it says that unless the new sign is dimensionally identical to all aspects of the non-conforming sign, for example, if a non-conforming sign is 8 feet wide, 4 feet tall, and 12 inches deep, mounted 8 foot high, 12 inch by 12 inch support, then the new sign must be the same exact dimension. Um, so it seems like, just in my own experience, I've lived in the area many years, I've seen several different signs there, so I certainly agree that signs have changed not just content, but si size and placement as well. Would you agree with that? That the sign on our lot has changed content-wise and then... Not, not content, size and placement. Uh, placement, to my sense, has been in roughly the same general area. And then there was, I know one sign has sort of a half moon cut out on the top, mm. sort of minor sort of architectural detail, I might say. So, but to the direct letter of the law yes there have been minor changes to the both content and rough sign shape of this yeah and and also reading this it seems to allow for upkeep of the sign you know if you need to replace a post as long as you're doing it with the same exact thing that would be allowed so it's it's not requiring that you never maintain it it seems to allow for that when i read this as well would you agree it does seem to. I also think that this statue is drawn in an impossibly tight manner that it basically creates the opportunity for foot fouls. Not we're, I think, generally in agreement that a sign has been at this location in roughly the same spot. I mean, maybe not down to the millimeters here. It has changed as the uses names have changed for that apartment complex, et cetera. And we certainly admit that now it says Rollinsford Storage. But if this, if this ordinance provision is drafted in such a way that it is really just there 
to give the town the opportunity to take an applicant's property under the guise of saying that you don't have this vested right because you moved infinitesimally, which is basically how tightly you can read this, it certainly seems like it raises a constitutional issue that we have a vested property right and this undoes it without compensation. Okay, and one other question. Do you have any kind of lease agreement with the property owner to have that sign on their property with their permission? We don't, and without trying to be flippant about this, title rights between property owners, I would say we have prescriptive rights, but that's certainly something that would be the jurisdiction of the Superior Court, not the Zoning Board. Okay. Okay. Mr. Jones. Um, so I agree that that would be the jurisdiction of the Superior Court. Um, my question for you is, does anybody have the dimensions of the current sign, the new one? Kevin, do we have that? I don't have the exact dimension. Okay. Um, my second question is, if the sign, the right of way when the work was done does not appear to have been moved. I wasn't able to find any sort of plan that says the line has changed. But the sign appears to have moved almost the same distance from the road, but now there's a sidewalk there. So it's hard for me to see that the sign has not moved in its location, at least a few feet. Maybe not the nine feet that the Google map, um, you know, because that has a skew to it. But um, if, the, if the sign has moved over that right-of-way line onto a private landowner's property, um, regardless of what the ZBA says here tonight, what's preventing them from just removing their sign? Removing our sign? Yeah. Again, so two pieces on that. The, to the first piece, I think that if the town told us to move something and then uses that as an argument to say something moved, that certainly seems inherently unfair as an excuse arguing that but our did sign Did the moved. town ask you to move a sign? If it was allegedly in the right of way. And again, these aren't documents that were provided in the record to me when I got the, the sign. Provided by? When I asked and received all the 1993 information, et cetera, we got the file for this. I did the city? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I so do you anything. have a copy of this 2019 plan done by TF Moran that shows the boundary? Um, I believe I have that in the file. Okay. So they show the Tara Meadows sign inside the city right away. Okay. Okay. I agree that in 2019 it was inside the city right away. And up until then, that might have been the same sign. It's, it appears to be the same shape. So regardless of what was decided in 2012, I think for intents and purposes, for the sake of argument, I'll say this is the same sign. But... Now, it appears to me sometime between 2018 and 2023, the sign was replaced. I don't know what the data on that is, but it appears to have been placed further back from the road than the, current, than the original sign was prior to the road work being done here. I'm not sure if the road work in, influenced the location of the sign. That's not for me to say. But if the sign has moved, how can you say that it's grandfathered when it doesn't meet the, sake of the, uh, the, you know, the specific wording of the ordinance? Again, I think that there's two pieces that the ordinance is incredibly tightly drafted in such a way that it was probably designed to try to undo any pre-existing non-conforming signs and bring them into compliance, but without really a reasonable balancing of what property owners vested rights were in that. Uh -huh. Again, if the, the point is to take this without compensation, it's a constitutional question on all of this. So. I don't know specifically how far this moved and if it was specifically because of what the town provided. I don't have that information at hand. So I think my problem here is now I'm kind of in this weird gray area where either the sign is on city property and then we're talking about an issue of grandfathering with the sign or the sign has moved onto private property and this is an issue for court. Regardless of that, I'm, I'm almost wondering if we even have, like aside from the surface level decision of the appeal. I mean, how far can we really can we really take this if this is going to become a civil matter? Well, you're at, this board still needs to rule. It's the, the, so the, they're appealing the administrative decision. We need to rule and the, appeal the administrative decision. And where it goes after that, correct. But right. uh, I'm just at, trying to tease out the guardrails. Yep. Uh, wait, yep. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Hilton. If you look at the pictures on the uh, Second, second to the last page. Uh, of what? There's lots of things. The second last page is microphone. Too. Okay. Notice of violation. Notice of violation. Okay. Um, the sign is definitely 
the, the bottom rung of the sign is larger. I mean, it's, it's added to that sign. But also, if you look at the, the street, the, the stop sign has moved because they added the sidewalk and they widened the road. So if you look at, you know, if you're looking at this, you know, the roadway has changed. So that now the sign looks like it's, or it is closer to the, to the sidewalk, to the stop sign, to everything. So, I mean, it, it, do you have a question for the applicant? Or are you yeah, just? I don't. I mean, is, does that seem like that's the case? Because it looks. I mean, if you look at the tree, the tree, the big tree at the back has moved. Oh, is tighter to the sidewalk also. So it has has that been investigated? Is that again hasn't been specifically investigated beyond looking at these pictures but again our understanding from our client and company institutional memory is that this sign has been in roughly the same spot and i'm not standing here tonight swearing to millimeters and inches about it but roughly the same size roughly the same location like very close and again if the board's concern tonight and if it's an opportunity to um split the baby basically and that that Rollinsford sign at the bottom needs to be incorporated into the sign dimensions we can play with all of that but the idea that this sign gets removed really does appear to be a taking without compensation in violation of our state constitution it's there's an opportunity here where we are willing again to be good corporate citizens here we'll go back to sign review the neighbor seems to not like red, wants to see blue. These are all things that I think we can deal with. But the idea that this sign that's been investigated, at least in 1993, for and about six months worth of letters back and forth, and is allowed to stay, the idea that there's a foot foul here where something minor changes and all of a sudden we don't have the vested rights to this sign seems unjust. Well, Mr. Fredette? Could I make the argument that the, to use your term, foot foul in place here is maybe that the, during the construction process, your organization and the city created a scenario where the proper legwork and proper situation wasn't created for the placement of this sign? certainly seems possible. I don't have more information on that than you Thank you. Sir. Hey, Mr. Jones. Yeah, I just have one more thing to close the argument. Um, you had just touched on the strictness of Ordinance 1920C8. Um, I just wanted to ask, as a board member sitting here, um, I certainly don't have any lawful ability to uh, kind of decide on the merits of that ordinance itself. I mean, to me, sitting here, it's lawfully adopted, and that would be a question for the courts. Would you agree? I would. Okay, thank you. I got a couple questions. So going back to the, the Noel letter in uh, na December 1993, so they seem to imply that the sign was adjacent to and between my property and Tri-City Road. So they seem to imply that the sign was on the right of way. Would you agree? I think the letter speaks for itself. I don't know his intentions on that, what okay, he was trying me, to say. Was the sign in the right of way? Again, without doing research and survey research on, on the changes potentially to the right of way, I have a hard time answering that definitively. Isn't that the gist of this whole meeting tonight is, is what the legality of this sign is and whether it can be there or not? Certainly. Okay. All right. So. We don't know whether, it, so he implies, we don't know whether it was in the right of way. All right, moving on. Um, in the Fisher letter, which I'm trying, in the, in the Fisher letter, um, it talks about an A-frame configuration sign. What's that mean? My sense is that would be a sign like this on post that way. So at some point here, the sign dimensions change, and I don't disagree with the, the thought process here that, okay, that changed. I don't know when 19.20 C8 was adopted. 
And that does seem like the kind of reasonable change that going from an A-frame sign, which you drive down that road, there are no A-frame signs here because that's an out-of-style sign. They all seem to have gone to these pedestal or post signs. So I think that's the sort of natural progression of, of time and sensibilities as to what looks good on a sign. And if that had been no way, no how can you do that, that should have been, a, you know, dealt with by the board in 1993, I would think. But in 1993, it was kind of left up in the air. It was no closure, correct? Correct. But again, in New Hampshire, we have several, as in all jurisdictions, we have several different legal and equitable theories about the idea that you can't just drag your feet. Latches is when you have facts that you have a colorable claim under the law, which 1993, they may have said, we can get rid of this. We have everything we need to do. But then to let the applicant rely on the, the lack of action, which is in itself action by the town, to keep the sign to then say 30 years later, whoops, we got it wrong in 1993 is again, it's just an unjust reading of the ordinance. So in your research, you found no documentation to close out the issue in 93. No, and I freely admit that, that I would love if it said that sign is perfect, you're good, you should keep it forever, but I just don't have those facts and I won't lie to this board. Okay. We heard it talked about that Exhibit J, the uh, sign application 93, talked about um, assessor's map 39 lot 20 which is the the applicant's property and not the property in which the sign is on correct this was 1993 or 2012 mm, let me find out because i don't you're right 2012 2012 and again i will note that for the purposes of this application and the violation it again used the applicant's law as the number so it seems to be the way the town has accepted this and we've just carried forward on that i don't know specifically why that assessor's parcel was chosen okay now okay as a sign, it appears in my mind, never mind, it's not a question for you, I got it. Um, so in 20, let's see anything about this. So in the, the we, we kind of talked about the the, the uh, change of the road and the ro the change in the road and the location of the sign, the potential movement. Um, so was, did you guys, do you have any documentation on, on the, the city, you don't know that whether the city asked to move that sign or not? I don't have that information. Okay, and you could find no documentation either way. Okay. Just trying to understand what's going on with that. All right. And again, Mr. Chairman, if I uh, may add a thought on that. Sure. That the, the owner of the property not liking this today in their letter, again, seemingly in large part because it's red, not blue. And again, we've spoken with them about the fact that we understand that if people knock on their door for our sign, that's annoying. So we've offered to add buy them more signage, something small that says leasing offices down the road. And again, I have no issue if, if the thing that gets the board into a good place for neighborly relations here is that this sign should be blue. Happy to make it blue. Okay. But if I get this right, the, the, uh, the sign right now, and I was looking for the picture that actually the vent they provided, Show the show the uh, rental units below it. So that was added to the sign that, that the storage unit piece was added below. And again, if the argument today was that piece doesn't comply because you've added it and it changes the dimensions, I think you have a stronger argument than the idea that our vested sign should be removed in its entirety. So was there any um, sign permit put in to add Rollins for self storage to that sign? No, I don't believe so. And again, we are contrite about that and willing to say that we messed up that piece of this we have a vested sign you can't piggyback onto this by adding another below piece that doesn't comply with this we will bring the sign into compliance with what was previously there under our vested rights i don't think that having a sign and having vested rights gives us as an applicant free reign to expand this thing to add laser lights to it i don't think any of that is true so again there is an opportunity here where this is a John Flatley company, taxpaying citizen of this town, trying to do right, does well building in that neighborhood, has an opportunity here that we have an appeal because the remedy provided by the building inspector in his review of this is you need to remove the whole thing. 
that's not the correct remedy here. There's vested rights here. And if we are required to go back to the sign with the, the little bump on the top or not the bump on the top or that a certain size is acceptable to the town, that's a solution that on behalf of my client, we can certainly live with. Okay. Mr. Jones. Um, so just for the sake of argument, um, there was a sign permit issued in 2012. And that was using the existing grandfathering status to approve the new sign. So let me just take us back for a moment that that sign approved in 2012 is identical to the one that was approved in 1993. The grandfathering at that time remains. Um, my question for you is, nobody has a survey of where the sign currently stands, and you have no dimensions on the new sign at all. So I don't know how I'm supposed to agree with you that the sign hasn't changed and hasn't changed dimension or location when I have none of that evidence presented to me. And if the argument then is that in 2012, by virtue of the sign being approved by the sign review committee, you are now vested through 2012, we can get that application and we can go back on a condition that the sign has to be the size of that and that content of the sign should go through the sign review commission. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that's the argument in the city. We'll discuss that later. But um, as for, I have a, a, a plan from TF Moran that shows that sign location on it in the right of way. So it's hard for me to say that this is in the same place when it doesn't really appear to be in the same place. This doesn't show the same road conditions. So, I mean, I, I just feel like if you're coming in for a sign, that's kind of the starting point. Uh, to that piece, I would also say that if you have a lot and the dimensions are that you have to have 100 feet of road frontage and the town changes the road at this parcel, let's say. So they change it, they widen the road. So now I have 99 feet of road frontage as measured on the front road there. And then say you're no longer protected because we change the dimensions of your lot. That seems, again. How, how would widening the road? It, oh, you mean widening the right of way? But that would be done through a recorded plan by licensed surveyors and all parties would be in agreement. That's a different type of issue. But again, I think that it gets to the same point, that if I have something compliant, either pre-existing non-conforming and therefore compliant or just compliant with the letter of the ordinance, and the town and the city does something that changes the status of my compliance, to then say, aha, got you, you're out of compliance and you have to remove the thing you have and have vested rights to, that can't possibly be good for public policy. I agree with you, but I think the problem I'm having is I have no evidence in front of me that after 2019, the sign was replaced in the same location. And that's the stipulation of the illegal sign rules. And again, we have the, the context provided by your fellow board members that there has been a sign here in roughly this location for the entire time. That's the best really I can give you on that. And the idea that you move infinitesimally small on this as the way this ordinance is written, it's gone, is a taking, absolutely. Not, not infinitesimally in this case, we just have the testimony from the owner of the property that says the sign is on there. So I, if there's a boundary dispute, I'd want to look at that as well. And that's, again, that's more than infinitesimal. We still say that, I mean, I will admit here that we have prescriptive rights to be on that property. That's, it's been in this fundamental location the whole time, and it's been a long period of years here. I fail to see how prescriptive rights for the sign location of the right-of-way extends onto a neighboring property. That's two different parcels of land. I, I don't have an answer. I mean, okay. that wasn't a Thank question. Thank you. That's all I have. Mr. Burnett. <clears throat> and I know this question has been answered. Can you give me the exact distance for which the sign has moved? No, I can't. Thank you. Mr. Brooks. So just a hypothetical situation here. If the sign was on the right of way next to the road and the neighboring property was actually a river and they had to widen the road and use all the existing land and you relocated that sign into the river, this would be a pretty similar story, but now you'd be dealing with a river instead of a landowner that doesn't want the sign there so it is clearly moved to a different location in, in, with that hypothetical situation that resembles this one 
If there were a river here and the municipality told me that my vested right to a sign was no longer allowed to be there, and in this case was functionally not allowed to be anywhere in your river, assuming I'm not allowed yep. with DES permits and a whole bunch right. of, we can run a hypothetical to ground <laughs> if we want to, yeah, but I don't but, think it helps us. Down that rabbit hole. Yeah, but, exactly. But you essentially run out of land because they've had to widen the road for traffic reasons and then it's a removal of my client's property rights either with or without compensation so either there was a taking here and we should be compensated for this or we're vested where we are i just want to clarify to the board that the right of way does not appear to have changed in the 20 years despite the construction of the road so the actual limits of ownership have not the, the changed. boundary line of the property does not appear to have changed correct yes i would agree i understand that as well Is that Mr. Brooks? Mr. Hilton. How much do you know how much um, distance there is between the sidewalk of the right of way, between the, the sidewalk, the edge of the sidewalk, and the property of the customer? Or the I don't specifically, and I will say that a number of the questions that the board have asked have been certainly astute questions, and they're better posed to a surveyor and if it makes sense for us to get some sort of a plot plan done to answer all of these questions for you if that's the kind of thing that would help the board which i very well believe it may we certainly can do that further questions by the board members up to the applicant okay final comments by the applicant Again, I appreciate your, your thoughts on all of this, and I do want to reiterate that we are here third on the agenda because we understand the value of the ordinance and are working to play within the, the terms of that as they are fairly applied to our property. This is an opportunity where a sign has been here at least for the 30 years since the town really took a deep dive on this and let us keep the sign to make us move this now. And again, I'm not saying that everything about this sign is letter perfect, I'm not arguing that we didn't change the shape at the top of this, et cetera. If there is a place we can get back to that's less draconian than saying you have a right to something, you now have nothing, I think that would be a nice compromise, and I hope the board will uh, at least consider that. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. Okay, with that, I'm going to close the public hearing. Regional impact. Uh, I don't foresee this having any regional impact. No, I'll, I'll make Brooks. I probably got to quote this, so. I'm, I'll move that the um, well actually this is a decision not even a variance right there I move that the appeal for administrative decision by John Flatley has no potential for regional impact we have a motion do we have a second a second by Mr. Perkins all those in discussion all those in favor raise your right hand okay that's is five zero discussion Mr. Pradet yeah, briefly. I mean, I think we have an admission from the applicant in my estimation that the sign has moved, which puts us in violation of the zoning ordinance. I think he raises a lot of points. I think there is a lot here. I think this board, in my opinion, needs to rule at face and maybe this is something, this is clearly in fairness, something that needs to be adjudicated in court I think this for this board to make a decision here is puts us at potential of denying property rights to the abutter who has raised a written complaint here okay. discussion mr. Jones and then mr. Brooks um, so I guess I kind of have two points to kind of shape our the contours of this here um, so is there any interest in requiring the applicant to do a boundary or a survey of that sign in its location compared to where where it is now and, and where it was originally because we have a record of where it was originally from 2019 and then then that would open up the possibility of allowing them to put it back in the same location in position if the sign had moved well, let me ask uh, Ms. Crosley, a question. So, are you allowed to have signs in a right of way? Pr private signs in a right of way? No. We do not permit. But does that still fall under the grandfathering? Because it seems like it's always been in the right of way. Well, go ahead. It 
there does appear to be a history of it located within our right of way, yes. So you're right. If uh, we could, you could argue legally, and I'm not sure the right answer whether it was grandfather in a right, if it was previously in a right of way, yeah, legally or not, which is a good question. Uh, would it be grandfathered? I don't know. Because then surveyors and attorneys could get their hands on this, which might provide us more information. It just, it's hard for us to rule on an, a sign that's under incorrect location that's so close to a boundary line without actually having the sign and the boundary line on the same plan. Um, we don't have the dimensions of the new sign, which so it's hard to verify whether or not the new sign and the old sign are the same square footage or uh, shape and height. But we do have the dimensions of the sign as it was installed in 2012 because we have that sign permit. Um, so that brings me to my second question is if we were interested in providing that continuance for the sake of letting this evolve further, um, there is some wording here from Shane that the 2012 permit is technically invalid because of invalid information submitted that the determination was made based on. But if we gave them saying in 2012, like that was the blank slate that we have to prove grandfathering back to, is there any interest in allowing that? No. <laughs> Fair enough. Those are my those are my two things. Not my opinion. Yeah. Another, another discussion, Mr. Brooks. So, you know, looking at our ordinance about the sign changing, you know, it it pretty much stipulates that it's got to be replaced with the exact same sign, or you would have to get a new approval for it. You know, obviously it calls out the exact same. I'm I'm sure they're not going to whine over an inch or two difference in size but I think we're talking feet in difference so even the size of the sign is significantly different and I'm not talking content I mean they've got the earliest one they mentioned a frame early on you know the a frame I assume is one of those portable ones that you just throw out like when you open at a shop and then you pull it in at night when you close you know more of a temporary sign you know then this Terra Meadows that had the arch top in the middle, and now we've got a bigger one that's square. I mean, it, there's certainly been a lot of changes to this, more changes than there's been approvals from what I'm seeing. So, you know, I, I find it hard to argue that the grandfathering would stay based on that. Second thing, the fact it's moved, apparently, without measurements from a surveyor. I guess I can't say 100%, but... I just My eyes don't deceive me. It looks pretty clear that it's moved, looking at pictures that prove it year after year. So, again, I, I see multiple reasons that this is a different sign in a different location without approvals for each one of them, is what I've gathered from this, what's been presented to me tonight. Okay, Mr. Perkins? Yeah, on the um, as built for the road that they provided, it shows that stop sign is actually inside of um, the private property, and that sign is definitely behind the stop sign, so and it's pretty easy to figure out that that sign is clearly on private property, and to think that they can move it from the right-of-way onto private property and claim their rights are more important than the property, only, property owner's rights, I do not agree with, and I'm definitely against, uh, or would be for the city's um, Recommendation. Deny the appeal. You would be yes. for denying the appeal. Yes. Yep. Yeah, Mr. Hill goes up. Yep. It depends on if if the sign was in the property or if if the sign was in the right of way and when the city widened the road and I don't know, did is this the same property owner from whenever that sign was moved? Or was there a deal made with, you know, with the previous property owner? I don't know. But the widening was done sometime after 2019, and the lot was condominiumized prior to 2019. So it's been the same owner since. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Brooks, then Mr. Verdat. You know, and on the property rights thing, I know that's not something that we get to decide, but, you know, if, as the lawyer is saying, that they have the legal right, constitutional right to keep this property, I would have to think that the property owner has the same constitutional right to only have on their property their property. You know, I, I would find it hard to believe that 
somebody could simply put a sign on your property. Uh, so I believe there's, you know, again, I, I'm not sure we can rule on that, obviously, but it certainly brings up quite a question. No. <laughs> Mr. Burdett, you all, oh, you all said Mr. Brooks? Yes. Mr. Burdett. Yeah, I mean, I think enough has been said about this. I think a company this large, clearly somehow the sign was moved. That seems evident how much. And the fact that somebody paid to move this sign and then to reconstruct this sign without any, any kind of a basic boundary survey. Um, ultimately, I think a series of events has put us in a position where we now have a code enforcement officer who has done his job and applied the ordinance as fit, and that's where we as a board have to sit. Yeah, I would say that based on the evidence presented, what we have for evidence, what we know, what we know, or what has been presented to us, which we have to take at face value, that the sign that existed in 1987 is not the same sign that exists today now. So the only doc the documentation provided by the applicant said it was an A-frame sign. It's no longer an A-frame sign. The pictures that we've seen all show that the sign has changed its shape many times throughout the years with no, and it would appear and only, only in 2012 was a permit applied for, so it's changed its shape without a permit, but it's actually changed its shape. So that's, takes, actually invalidates its grandfathered. The evidence that we have indicates that the sign was moved. That again, invalidates the grandfathered. Um, if it was previously in the right of way, that, that makes it, an, and in my mind, and I'm, I always thought you couldn't have a sign in the right of way, and it appears that's the case. So that would mean in the very beginning, it was an illegal sign if it was in the right of way from the get go. The, the signs changed its configuration many times without a permit. The permit that was applied in 2012 was incorrect, was stated the wrong property. So th there's a lot of things from the evidence presented here that would invalidate the grand this sign's grandfather, its status as a grandfathered sign, if it even was ever established. I mean, the only thing I can think was established was grandfather and A-frame sign, and that doesn't exist anymore. That's my thoughts. Mr. Hilton. The challenge with all this is, uh, you know, if the sign was there in 2000 or in 93, whenever, whenever. 87 when the yeah, ordinance was put 80, into place? When it was put in place and no one said anything about it and it stays there for so long, you know, I understand where he's coming from as far as saying, hey, sign's been there forever or some sign has been there forever, and now you're coming back and saying, oh, you can't do that because the code's changed. Well, we could do that. You go through, through the town of Summersworth, you could, you, could, you could, oh, he's out of compliance, he's out of compliance, he's out of compliance. Where do you stop? And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have codes, but, uh, you know, everyone always talks about the slippery slope. Well, this is one of those cases. So, you know, and that's the challenge of all this is it would be better if, as neighbors, if you went and talked to each other and worked it out. I don't want to be in this position. I don't think any of us want to be in this position, but here we are. So there's a, it's a mess. Right, just to clarify, even as neighbors, it's not the neighbor, it's the city that says it's not a compliance, not a grandfather's sign, it's not the neighbor. But the city probably got called by the neighbor. Yeah, maybe, I don't know that. <laughs> I don't know that. So the, the city's always called as a weapon. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Could be. Mr. Fredat. And I'd like to clarify, my understanding for the record is it's not that any of the ordinance has changed, and it's not a change of ordinance that's being applied here, it's a change of sign that's being applied or a loss of grandfathering. Correct. 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 So in effect in 1987. Correct. Right Thank you. Mr. Hilton. Was this ordinance in effect back in 87? That's when the ordinance came into effect in 1987. And no one said anything about the sign at that time. Well, so when the sign was there, it was grandfathered. Right. This was pre-existing. 
So the eighth. Toby said it had to be removed. Yeah. Our issue is we think the sign has changed and its grandfathering status is lost. Yeah. Well, it's definitely it's changed size-wise for sure. There's no doubt about that. And location could be because of the widening of the road, could be all kinds of different things, but no one said anything about it. That's all more. And private property rights is definitely an issue here. You know, another thought is I'm sure that when they asked, when the attorney asked for the file on this, I'm sure that everything in the file would have been presented. So if there was something that, I lost my train of thought, that talked to, you know, a notice that, hey, we're constructing a wider road and this needs to be moved, I would imagine that would have been in the file as well. And we don't see this anywhere either. So, I, I, again, I kind of understand the lack of action as an action as well, but, you know, there's no proof of what's being said here on some of this stuff. And too many times, if you ask me, it's say several people have dropped the ball on both sides. For the discussion by the board. All right. Um, so once we make the motion, you know, Mr. Hilton, you're, 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 you're to be silent. Okay. Just helping you out. Mr. Fredette. After review of the application, the file. Sorry. After review of the application, the file, and all the information presented to the board, I feel that the appeal should be denied for the reasons discussed, and I move that the request of John J. Flatley for an appeal from an administrative decision of the Code Compliance Officer dated January 31st, 2024, to remove a sign, to remove the off-premise sign from the intersection of Tri-City Road and High Street associated with the property located at 19 Tri-City Road, map 39, lot 2, be denied. A motion to be a second. Second by Mr. Perkins. Discussion. Mr. Jones. I'd just like to clarify um, that the reason is because the sign has changed location and dimensions, so or appears like to, to have. So what I'd like to do is I'm gonna, I'd like to propose an amendment to that, that motion. So you would, and in, in that amendment, it will include, so you would, you would say that it's changed. I, let me read you my motion, uh, and then we can, and then the sign is not, the, re, the reason we're denying is the sign is not grandfathered as it has been altered, and this is where we need to be clear, based on configure, the con configuration, relocation, and shape and dimension have been changed after passage of the ordinance. Is, so it would be altered, let's see. I, I think appears to be altered based on the evidence that we have. Yep, that, see, I was thinking about that, yep. Yeah. Appears, appears, appears to be changed. It's hard to certify that How about without just a based, based on the evidence presented? Yeah. Based on, based, based Based on, on the knowledge or evidence presented, so we only can go based. The sign has let's see. The sign is not grandfathered, as based on the evidence presented, it has been. Um, it appears to have been. Appears to have been. Yeah, we don't have without a survey. How can you how can okay. you certify that? Okay. Appears to have been altered, relocated, and the shape slash dimension changed mm -hmm. after the passage of the ordinance. All right. So here, here's so here's the motion I'm going to make. Now, do we want to just be clarity as we're talking? Um, do we want to do anything about the uh, sign permits approval? Do we want to include anything about validity of the sign permit approval? I don't permit? think we need to weigh in. It doesn't. It doesn't seem. I don't know. Do you think it's needed for any future legal action? Could or couldn't be. I. So, Ms. Crosley? I'd say focus on the appeal at hand. Yeah. Okay. Um, no reason to broaden the scope. Yeah. It's yeah. not. Yep. Yep. Can do. Not. I the can, application I can in front of you is not four different signs. Right. Yep. And yet we only have two discussions of sign permits. Permits. All right, but it's been recommended that we'll just stick to the reason we're denying it, which is because, so the, I, make, I make a motion that this, this denial is because the sign is not grandfathered as it appears to 
as it appears based on the evidence presented, it has been altered, relocated, and the shape slash dimension have been changed after passage of the ordinance. That's my motion. Do I have a second? Uh, you already have a, you have a motion. Right. I'm, uh, this is an amendment to the motion. But thank you. Yeah. yeah, I'll second. Second by Mr. Jones. Discussion on the amendment. Okay. Can we vote them all at once or we have to vote one at a time? We have to vote one at a time, don't we? Well, no, the whole thing. No, there's only one. It's only one. It's only one. Right, because so, it's an appeal of a decision. Yeah. So we only yeah. have to vote. Okay, but we don't have to vote, vote on the amendment. So you would, if you're proposing amendment, the original motion maker typically, who is? Would say I agree Brad, with the amendment. If Brad accepts the person who made the motion and the seconder accepts your amendment, yep. then that becomes the motion. Okay. Mr. Fredette, are you all set with the motion? Mr. Chair, I accept your amendment. Mr. Perkins. Okay, further discussion on the motion. The motion is to deny the appeal based on the fact that it has lost the grandfathered, it is no longer grandfathered based on our discussion. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Five zero, motion passes. All right, three bravo. Michael L. Hill is seeking a variance from Table 4A1 and Table 5A1 to allow the principal use of a two-unit dwelling without the required lot size or frontage on a property located on Turgeon Lane in the residential slash single-family R1 district, Assessor's Map, map 8, Lot 34A, this be a case 02-2024. It's a public hearing. I open a public hearing. Ms. Crosley. Okay. So the applicant is seeking to construct a two-unit dwelling on a lot located in the residential single-family district. The lot has 100 feet of frontage on Turgeon Lane and is 0.3 acres, which is about 13,098 square feet. The lot is serviced by municipal sewer and water. Um, so where they're proposing to construct a duplex, this is not a permitted use in the R1 district. Um, we have also provided information um, the R1 district dimensional wise is um, subject to note five of that table, which says that lots are to be developed in accordance with the use that is being proposed. Um, so we have highlighted what the dimensional requirements for um, an R2 lot is, which is larger than what is there for the lot. Um, there is a bit of a little bit of history for the property. There was a variance granted to create this property in 2003, um, which granted, it created two non-conforming lots, both properties having less than the required frontage and lot size. And um, then the subdivision was subsequently approved in 2003. Um, they have responded to all five questions uh, for the variance. So it is ready for the board to discuss with the applicant. Questions for Ms. Grosley for? The applicant, please come forward, state your name, and why we should, gr should grant this variance. My name is uh, Michael Hill. I uh, live at 12 River Road in Rollinsford, and I've owned the lot since 2003. Uh, the reason that I'm asking for the variance is the if you look at the street, the two lots right next to me both have 75 feet of frontage. They are both duplexes. There's one at the end of the street that's an eight unit. So there's 13 lots on this street that are in that R1 zone. Three of them are already multifamilies. Um, so I think it would fit. I, I don't think it's gonna change the, the neighborhood. Uh, and the one that's an eight unit actually is got more units per square foot than, than I'm gonna have. The uh, lot that is two lots away from me is a smaller lot than mine and only has 75 feet of frontage. So it, it appears that, um, you know, I think since 2003, that table has changed four times. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm asking to see uh, the city seems to be in need of workforce housing. Um, I own 10 units that I rent in the city. Um, if you look at the rents, most of them are lower than what the standard rent is. So I think it would benefit the city. I think it would be a good use of the lot. And I'm just asking for the variance. Could you briefly go through the, how you meet the five criteria? 
sure. So number one, it says explain uh, how the proposal would not diminish the surrounding property values. Three of the 12 existing structures on Surgeon Lane are already multiple unit dwellings, two of which have less than 100 feet of road frontage. The three multifamily homes are map eight, lot 40, 36, and 35. 35 and 36 are direct to butters to me. Neighboring property values would not be affected or diminished because you already have multifamily units on the street. You don't have to read a word for word, just, just in okay. general, just right. whatever, whatever you want to. Um, granting the variance, uh, I don't think it would be contrary to public interest because it already, there's already multifamily. I mean, I guess I'm going to keep coming back to the, <laughs> there's already multifamilies on this street. And uh, I think what happened is the zoning got changed, uh, and I'm not, I'm not really sure why, uh, but that's what happened. I, I, I'm going to guess that it encompassed a big portion of land where there were no multifamilies, but this street is got a lot of them, and it's outside of the zone, but there's also a four unit right on the beginning of the street, um, which has a driveway that comes off of Turgeon Lane. But that, to be fair, that is permitted in that section because uh, it's a different zoning. So, um, let's see. Uh, on, on number three, I just said that, uh, well, you know what, I, yeah, I mean, you guys have read this. <laughs> so, right. I'm not going to insult your intelligence. And uh, I know I don't meet the, the lot size. Um, I guess I'm just asking that because it's been done on three others, uh, could it be? This is the only lot that's not built on on the street. So that's it. Okay. So what we'll do is uh, any, see if anybody else wants to, um, sorry, see if anyone else wants to talk and then we'll ask you about for questions. Sure. Um, I'll just introduce my son, uh, Zach Hill. Um, he was going to build the duplex on there. He was actually going to live in the duplex and then rent the other unit. So um, I know you can do an auxiliary dwelling unit, but we'd rather prefer to do it uh, as a duplex. Okay. All right. Questions for the applicant? All right. So the first question I have is, have you envisioned what type of house you would build on it? What it would look like? Would it look yeah. like a duplex, a townhouse? Yeah, I would do two townhouse styles. And what I was trying to do was have driveways on either side so that each would be accessed separately. They would all have their own vertical space. Uh, and we could even, you know, I mean, I would maintain the lot. I maintain the lots on all of mine. Uh, and you can drive by that lot any time and the grass is always mowed. <laughs> So, so in driving down that street, which I did do, I, I mean, obviously the, the unit at the very end is a, is a large unit, and it's very obviously a, um, a multi-unit building. It's eight units. Okay. The other houses all appear to have been, at least originally, single family. And the two that are duplexes appear to be, like, sing, appear to be single family. Yeah, they're not, here. though. Yeah, if you pull the tax cards, they're listed as, okay. Not disagreeing. Okay. So okay. Would, build, would putting in a, so what I'm wrestling with, putting in a, a townhouse-style building, would that change the look of the neighborhood or the character of the neighborhood? Because it's different than the others. Um, well, I don't think so, because you have that eight unit sitting at the end of the street. So, and then right on the other side, you have condos. Those are all townhouses. So you, you want to talk about abutters that are townhouses, I mean, if you'd prefer an up-down and make it look like a single family, we could do that too. I can do whatever plan fits the neighborhood. I mean, style, I'm not, I'd prefer to do a townhouse, but it wouldn't matter to me how it looked. I could build it to look like a single family. All right. Mr. Brooks? So obviously the history here shows that this got a variance to even be divided off into two lots and both non-conforming at that point. And even as a single family, I don't read this to be conforming for that either. Correct, you're correct. So it seems that we've got a lot created with a variance to be less than what's required. And now we're asking 
you know, which by right, you're going to be able to build a house. I mean, it's, right. you know, you can't argue that. Right. But then to ask for yet another variance to put a duplex on here seems to really be pushing the whole variance issue to the extreme. And, you know, obviously these other buildings... I don't know if they're ADUs. I don't know if they're full-on duplexes. They're full-on duplexes. Yeah, I just I don't have any proof either way here. I, well, I if you look at the tax card, that's the proof. Okay, but would an ADU come up as an R2 also? Two unit? I, I don't uh, know. The, the, these are before they had ADUs. These were built. You can go, I mean, you can look at them. They were converted before I bought the lot in okay. 2003. Oh. So okay, so maybe we can assume it. They've that been way, duplexes then. for a long time. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, where where I'm going with this is with with the variances, the hardship is usually the hardest thing to meet, and you know you're certainly able to build a one family unit on this. Sure. But what's the hardship for the second unit to go a step further and ask for a duplex out of it? I guess the hardship that I'm asking for is you've allowed it to happen three other times that it shouldn't have happened or not you uh the city has allowed it to happen uh so i'd like it to happen <laughs> so on that uh, so, i mean some of those may be may be grandfathered obviously they would be grandfathered to be legal so i'm not sure that, so i don't know if those other units were approved by uh, a variance i'd have or, to go or I'd, i should have done the research i didn't but, do but, the research but, yeah, yeah. Tell them, did you have a question? Yes. Um, the hardship would be the cost of building nowadays. Everybody is trying to put more on less. So um, the cost of property isn't going down. The cost of equipment or materials is not going down. And we do, and I mean, I've, I've owned this type of property before and whenever you live in one and rent the other one out it keeps your cost low and it also provides a good quality product for the town so and uh, that's you know i think that that's that's part of the hardship for all of variances nowadays is you know the cost of doing business is continues to go up we complain that we don't have enough housing but we keep saying no so okay though cost is a hardship it's not a hardship in the sense of the zoning ordinance which is the fact that there's is there some special condition of the property which is, results in an unnecessary hardship owing to special so explain a little enforcement of the revision so enforcement of the requirement to have an r1 versus an r2 result in an unnecessary hardship because there's a special condition of the property it distinguishes it from other properties in this area so is there a special condition of this property that makes it and, I, and i'm going to these are my words not the, the, these words yeah. makes it more likely that it's or, or better suited for a multi-family than a single family well i think it's better suited for a multi-family than the two abutters are because they have 25 feet less frontage uh, less separation, more cars piled up on smaller, narrower lot. Um, so I think this would be a much nicer looking duplex. Uh, that's what, just my thought. So is there any special reason? So so not only so we have the one re, one variance because there's actually it's actually two and two or almost three variances. One is for an R1 to an R2 or duplex and a single. And then the second one is the size. So is there any special condition of the property such that the not having the allowable frontage or the allowable acreage that this that makes this but makes it so but this property is still better suited for a multifamily? Well, I, again, I think it's better suited than the one that's two doors down because it has less frontage and less acreage. And then if you and if you want to talk about units per square foot, go to the 0.69 acres divided by eight. That's less than a tenth of an acre per per unit. I'm going to have 0.15 per unit. Okay. So, that's those would be my yep. my points of interest. Now, just now, just as a point of clarification, just to make sure. Now, you, you stated in here that you can't build a single family on that property. No, 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 no. I didn't say that. It says you can't do it without it being a non-conforming lot. 
but you've already addressed that. Mr. Brooks uh, pointed out that to get this as a single family, it had to get a variance to do that. Right, so which is already but, in place. Yeah, I, I no, okay. yeah. I okay. just yeah, want to make sure. I, I, just I know make sure I can build a single family. Okay, yes. okay, just want to make sure we're all yes. clear on that one. No, absolutely. Yeah. Other questions? Mr. Fredette. The spirit of the ordinance is observed, or this request is not contrary to the spirit of the ordinance. Don't worry when you speak to this, you won't insult my intelligence. I don't have much, but how does this not, how does this not run contrary to the spirit of the ordinance? I think the spirit of the ordinance was to uh, maintain a nice neighborhood. Um, I think putting a duplex in here isn't going to it's not going to change the neighborhood because you've already got multifamilies in here. That's, I guess that's what I'm saying. So that's, if it changes the spirit of, the, if it's not in the spirit of the ordinance, then neither were the other three. <laughs> that's what I'm, <laughs> I, I'm going to come back to that. You know, I mean, you've told Johnny, Susie, and Sally they can do it, but Mike can't. Uh, and not you. I, 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 I shouldn't say that. We understand. That, we understand. You we know say. what I mean. Uh, We're not disagreeing. You know, it's been permitted, um, and um, yeah, I know. I mean, I know mine will be. Well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Mr. Jones. So, sorry, Brad. Don't. I, I have Mr. Oh, Fredette, hold on. Mr. Fred, you, you all set, Mr. Fredette? I'm good. Okay, Mr. Jones. So the problem with applications such as these is um, kind of the slippery slope thing, right? Sure. Where if we just start granting variances because we don't like the minimum frontage, well, the people voted for that amount of frontage and that minimum lot requirement. And I understand that it's very restrictive, right. but it applies to everybody equally. So just because every lot down the street is also nonconforming doesn't it doesn't make the hardship on your lot any more meaningful than theirs, right? So if we gave a variance to you, we'd have to give a variance for everyone. That's kind of the test for that hardship criteria. So kind of what I need to help, I need you to help me tease out is what about this lot specifically is uh, kind of kind of to what to Mr. Kaiser said here. Um, what, what makes it specifically that the, you feel that this lot is being unfairly hindered by the ordinance that your neighbor's lot is not? Yeah, I, I think it's being an unfair. Well, I, I think it uh, deserves to be a duplex lot because it's happened three other times already. Mm -hmm. So when you say uh, you don't want to set a precedence, you've already set the, not you. The city's already set the precedence because there's already three properties there yeah. that are less conforming than mine will be. The difficulty so. is I'm not sure how those lots were created, right? So I can really only look at yours in a vacuum. Sure. So... I need something I've, about uh, your lot specifically. Yeah. And I've, your argument can hinge on the neighbors, and I, I totally get that. I'm very receptive to that argument. It just sure. it doesn't meet that third criteria. Oh, I appreciate what you're saying. Yep. Uh, yeah, I just, um, I guess I don't have an answer for you. Okay, thank you. Oh, sure. Further questions for the applicant? Okay, last comments by the applicant. No, thank you for hearing my uh, variance Ranch request. request. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hill. With that, I close the public hearing. Regional impact. I don't see that this uh, application has any regional impact. Any disagreement? Mr. Perkins? Uh, per RSA 3656, local land, no, wrong one. Um, I move that the variance request of Michael Hill does not have potential for regional impact. We have a motion. We have a second by Mr. Uh, Brooks. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. 5-0, motion passes. Discussion on the variance. Mr. Jones. I can't help but feel these types of variances are a little bit tragic in that um, I very much like the proposal, but it's difficult to try and prove that hardship criteria when, you know, every single lot in the zone is suffering the same, the same restriction. Um, so it's kind of up to the city to, to rezone that and I, I'm not sure it meets the hardship criteria for us tonight. Okay. Mr. Brooks. Uh, and, you know, I, I certainly understand the need for more housing, but at the same time, we can't just arbitrarily say yes to everything without reasons. You know, there's a whole process, 
you know, case law, whatever you want to call it, as to how this works. And the ordinance that's in effect has been in effect. How these other properties nearby came in, maybe they grandfathered, maybe they snuck in. I don't know, but, you know, maybe they got a variance. I don't have anything here to tell me that definitively. And, again, each one would sit on its own condition and circumstances. So maybe there was something on that property. I don't know. Um, you know, this I was already had a variance where it's not even conforming for the one lot technically, but obviously it's a existing lot. There's no way he's not going to be able to build a house there. Um, you know, just unfortunately we have to go by the ordinances that are in front of us. I, I know the city's talking about making changes. They never do it fast enough. Um, and I agree they can't make these changes fast enough because we do need more housing, but I just don't have the reasonings and the conditions that say, yes, we should grant a variance in this case. For discussion. Yeah, I would agree. The, the, the applicant certainly has the heart in the right place and he takes care of his property. He's asking for two things. One is to put a multifamily in a single family. Um, and we can find no criteria that were such that the lot is being unfairly jeopardized. Additionally, he wants, it wants to, uh, asking for a variance for the frontage. Typically, the best thing, the best way to explain a frontage, a hardship, is if you had a pie-shaped lot and you put that building in, in the back, then <coughs> having a smaller frontage really doesn't affect it. You still maintain the density of the neighborhood. Um, I have a hard time with the size of the lot. I usually, I have a hard time finding the criteria that a lot that you should grant a variance for the size because the size is the minimum size and it's hard to find a criteria. So I would agree that, that I, I can't support this variance based on the hardship criteria. It just does not have the unique criteria, a special condition that the, the uh, ordinance unnecessarily burdens it. Further discussion? Chair, I understand a motion. Mr. Brooks. After review of the application, the file, and all the information presented to the board, I feel that the hardship criteria and the spirit of the ordinance criteria have not been satisfied. And I move that the request for Michael L. Hill for a variance from Table 4A1 and Table 5A1 to allow the principal use of a two-unit dwelling without the required lot size or frontage on a property located on Turgeon Lane, Map 8, Lot 34A, be denied. The motion to a second. Second by Mr. Jones. Discussion on the motion. Can you just help clarify for me why the, <coughs> the uh, just so I, I'm clear on it, why the, the fifth criteria, the spirit of the ordinance isn't met? Spirit of the ordinance um, speaks to having a single family on that size lot it's in our one zone so it's just not following that residential neighborhood okay our one our one neighborhood okay for a discussion on the on the uh, motion the motion is to deny the variance based on cri the hardship criteria and the spirit of the orange criteria okay all those in favor of the motion raise your right hand Motion passes 5-0. Unfortunately, the applicant, the variance is denied. All right, moving on to item 3C. Rollins for storage is seeking a variance from section 19.20.C.2.F <coughs> to allow an off-premise sign on a property located at 1 through 4 Royal Drive in a business district, Assessor's Map 39, Lap Lot 02, ZBA case 03, 2024. It's a public hearing. I'll open the public hearing. Ms. Crosley. All right. So the applicant is seeking to um, install an off-premise sign on the property located in Summersworth, um, known as 1 through 4 Royal Drive, um, Assessor's Map 39, Lot 3, on behalf of the business located in Rollinsford on parcel, this is Rollinsford, parcel number 132, which is accessed through the subject lot in Summersworth um, from the private drive, Royal Drive. Um, the request is to install, which is at the end of Tri-City Road. Um, the request is to install one freestanding internal illuminated double-sided 32 square feet on each side for a total of 64 square feet 
um, sign. The applicant would need to reduce the sign, um, size of the sign, if so, per the district, without a variance to support the proposed size of the sign, the applicant would need to reduce it based off of the requirement of the district down to 20 square feet in surface area on each of the two sides for a total of 40 square feet. If they did want a variance for um, the size, they could seek that, obviously. Um, there's a little bit of history. The lot was created, um, some subdivision information, the site plan. Um, the storage units were approved through site plan um, through Summersworth and Rollinsford um, in 2022. And um, they did apply for a permit for the sign, which we denied, and therefore they came here as that next step. And they have addressed the five criteria for the board to address the application. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Crosley? Mr. Jones. Um, just for clarity's sake, the size of the sign is not in these application materials tonight, so that is not a question we're weighing on, right? Correct. The application is only for to allow for the sign. Okay. Yeah. Correct. So they can reduce the sign to be compliant with the ordinance, or they could seek additional relief. Correct. In the okay. Future. Thank you. Correct. Any other questions for Ms. Crosley? The applicant step forward. Please state your name. And we should grant the variance. Eli Lano, attorney with Bernstein, Schur in Manchester, uh, on behalf of John Flatley Company, joined again by Kevin Walker of John Flatley Company. Uh, before I get into the criteria, I guess we overlooked this and didn't discuss it with staff, but if we just do the one side, how does the ordinance then work in terms of square footage allowed? So for the business district, um, sorry. Go ahead. We'll have to look into that. <laughs> um, so for the business district, the way that it regulates for freestanding signs, it says that um, the size of a f of said free. Paragraph you read. I'm reading um, 1920 D two E. 1922 D E. 1920. Yeah. D. It's two E. Yeah. Um, so the <laughs> size of said freestanding sign shall not exceed 20 square feet in area in surface area on each of two sides or a, a total of 40 square feet on all sides. No freestanding sign shall be more than eight feet in height above finished grade. Um, so it's shall not exceed 20 square feet on, in surface area on each of two sides. So each side can be 20 square feet? Yeah, to be okay. a total of 40 square feet between the two of those sides. Okay. Um, so. Can I just have one moment to confer with sure. my clients? It's not two sides of 20 or a total of 40? You, you, can't, you can't have 40 on one side, if that's what you're asking. I don't know. That's, I do not believe so. I don't. For a total of 40 square feet on all sides. Okay, How's so that could be one side, 40 square. Was, hold, 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 wait one. How's the city interpret it? It depends how the city has routinely interpreted it. As we all know, the English language is... Gotta love administrative gloss. <laughs> we don't get a lot of freestanding signs in the business district. Um, so... So size-wise, though, since we're not dealing with the size tonight, I mean, you, you can resolve that later on. Uh, we, you didn't because the application doesn't include the size and the variance, and so the, any abutter or any other all the process hasn't been done. So we can't approve anything different than what is allowed in the size. I understand entirely. I, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. If you yeah, had. so, I mean, we can continue with this portion of it, and then they, you you can re resolve that later to make sure we get we get the right answer. We want to make sure we get the right answer and not an off the cuff answer. Okay, because if we can do forty uh, square feet. Is it 40? I have my numbers right here. 40 square feet on one side, which would we could do that, and the applicant would be okay on the side coming into the property because you're looking for clear signage. Once you're leaving our property and heading back out on Tri-City, it's less important. So if we can do 40 square feet on one side, 
and be compliant with the ordinance, we would move forward with that piece of it and not need variance relief. Well, on you that. still need for that. So, for and, that. And, that, and so, we're not even asking for that tonight yeah. anyway. So that's you can resolve that later because that's not in this variance. All we're doing tonight is the location of the sign to allow for. So the request was to just for allowing for the off-premise sign on the property. That was what the variance was seeking. I understand so, yeah. that entirely. But if I'm allowed. For question and I don't know the board may not be willing to answer this but if 40 fair s square feet is compliant and I don't need to come back with an extra variance relief on that I'd be fine hopefully getting a variance for location and a compliant single-sided sign the planning, of a compliant the planning size. department will determine that and then let you know okay may I I, th I think what we're trying to say is for the purposes of the hearing tonight we don't need to necessarily know the square footage of the size it's, okay. it's irrelevant it Fair is, enough. but obviously I'll have to come back if I need another if variant, you, so I'm trying to sort that. Right. Yeah. Right. But you can handle that. After yeah, we're happy to work with you yeah. uh, on a staff level regarding this allowable size. Perfect. Um, All right. More than willing. Uh, you've certainly heard a lot from me tonight, so why don't I get into the five criteria? Um, the value of the property will not be diminished by this sign. This is, as you know, one of the denser areas in terms of commercial development as well as the residential uses owned by my client in this area. And throughout all of that, there's a large amount of signs for different businesses, national chains, the grocery store is right there with a signage package, et cetera. So there's not going to be a diminution in value by having a uh, compliant sign that's well designed and in the right place. And um, so... Uh, and then getting into the other criteria is not contrary to the public interest. So the New Hampshire Supreme Court has passed basically two tests for what contrary to the public interest standard is, and that's you can't change the essential character of the neighborhood and you can't threaten the public health, safety, and welfare. So as I noted in your first criteria, the essential character of this neighborhood is a mix of dense uses between the residential uses, which do have signs, and then various commercial uses and gas stations, et cetera, all of which have signs. So adding one more sign here will certainly not change the essential character of the neighborhood. And then in terms of the public health, safety, or welfare, this will be uh, compliance, setback, et cetera, in the correct spot that complies with what the ordinance is looking for on that. Um, not going to be in an eyesight such that it's a problem for anyone driving, passing motorists, et cetera, on Tri-City Road. Um, a literal enforcement of the provisions. So this is the hardship piece of this and relates to special characteristics of the lot. This is an interesting lot in that it is predominantly in Rollinsford across the town line, but only accessible from Summersworth. So that's a unique characteristic and that, or a special characteristic and that very few properties have this. And as such, it means that if we were to put a sign like we're requesting today on the lot as it is, you already have to be at the lot, which undoes the value of what a sign is in trying to find the property you're going to. So that's a, a unique special characteristic of the lot um, and no fair relationship with the ordinance provisions that there's a preference for on-premises signs, but in this case, an on-premise sign has nearly no value. So it's outside of what the ordinance is requesting. And in terms of being a reasonable use, signs are allowed in Summersworth. It's a reasonable use to have a sign in general, and then it's reasonable here. This is a property that the Flatley companies also own. We are both property owners on different parcels. It's a reasonable use for where we put it so that it's on one of our properties to benefit the other and sort of benefit the complex at large. Um, number four is that um, how granting the variance would do substantial justice. Supreme Court's held that the substantial justice factor is really a balancing test where you can't outweigh the rights of the owner through um, the benefit of the town or it's an injustice in this case there's not a negative piece here for the town if you allow one sign that allows users to uh, access this property know where they're going travel the roadways safely not getting lost turning u-turns being like i don't know where i am oh there's the sign i continue down this road i am in the right place 
And it certainly has a benefit to the owner as well, because if we can have our customers find the site and get there happily, that's good for business in general. So the balancing test is satisfied. And then um, not contrary to the spirit of the ordinance, your zoning ordinance uh, requests clear readable signs compatible with community character. We are providing a clear and readable sign. Again, it provides a directional bearing so that people can get to this site. Um, the community character, we've talked about the character of the neighborhood, et cetera. This will be in keeping with what's there and new and attractive and certainly not against the spirit of the ordinance. Happy to answer questions or go further into detail on any piece of this. And also you have what I've drafted as well um, to be supplement my testimony. Okay. You, you just want, I, I have to ask, would you like to speak? I'm good. Okay, I have to ask. <laughs> Mr. Jones. Um, I, I guess I just have a clarifying question. Where exactly does the public right of way end of Tri-City Road and where, where does it become private, a private roadway servicing the... Right yeah. The yeah. You're going to have to go to the, the mic and answer. Can you use this mic? <laughs> Can I use that mic? Uh, would affect the, will the camera get it? Still get it? Okay, yes. <laughs> and this is, for it's the record, moving. Kevin Walker from the Flatley Companies, and he is also an engineer. Thank you. Licensed. Thank you. Are you Big Dan? I, I, am, not, <laughs> I am not Big Dan. <laughs> um, There's a picture in the staff memo that gives you kind of an idea of yeah, where so their property on plan, starts. Yeah, on this plan, the edge of the, the city-owned right-of-way is actually way back here somewhere. So the sign's entirely on private the, property? The, si the sign is entirely on private property. Does that still Correct. need to meet the zoning ordinance if it's not visible from the public road? Yes. Okay. It's because it's on a different lot. It's so still a all sign. owned by the same... It's general organization but but the sign ordinance covers signs visible from public right-of-ways and this doesn't appear to me like it's visible from a public right-of-way there's a chance you could see it from the end of Tri-City Road so this is the end of the public road right where that yellow line is okay and the sign is somewhere down in this area it's, it's around a turn but okay. it's around a turn it's you know we can discuss that a bit later you do have jurisdiction to say that a variance isn't necessary. I've never had that happen, but it would be delightful. Just, just try. <laughs> this is why I'm bringing it up. I'm, I, I feel like yeah, it's, it might not, uh, it might not Put even. Up, please. Yeah. Uh, questions I think, for the applicant. Questions for the applicant. I think that's my only question. Thank you. Okay. All right, I got to, so, and, and I'm being a stickler here. Mm -hmm. So in, in your application, um, in th under 3A, and we talk. We we always talk about the hardship criteria. And in there, you say that there is not enough. There is not a viable on-site location for a sign. Okay, so that's the the uniqueness of the Rollinsford lot. What's the uniqueness for the Summersworth lot? I know the answer. I just want you to tell me. Part of this law is. So, are you asking about the lot where I'm asking to place the sign? Correct. I think the special condition there is that it is a viable location where for in conjunction with the location where we are requesting the subject location where a sign is not viable, this law is unique in that it is viable to represent the subject location. Because it is the only access to the lot. Correct. Okay. It's pretty evident, but it was kind of interesting when you had read it. You were talking about the Rollinsford lot, which we have no jurisdiction over. Understood. So this piece of land that we're putting it on, this parcel 4492 or 3, 39.3, 393, correct? That's correct. Where putting, is that, that's where we're putting it. Are there any other signs on this property? Kevin Walker, John Flatley Company. Uh, the only signs is we have a, a couple of pillar signs at the end of the Tri-City Road right away where the private road starts that just has Thomas Apartments on it. Pillar sign? What's a pillar sign? They're, <coughs> they're upright stone that says Thomas Apartments on it. Okay. That's it. All right. So, Ms. Crosley, does it, um, never mind, I'll ask you later. All right, other questions for the applicant? All right, 
Final comments by the applicant. Again, I appreciate your consideration and familiarity with the sign ordinance in your town. Okay, thank you very much. With that, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Right. First order of business is regional impact. Personally, and I don't think it has, even though the other lot is in Rollinsford, I don't think putting a sign in the Summersworth lot has any regional impact. Any disagreement? Okay, Chair. Mr. Brooks. I move that the variant, oh, no, I'm sorry, wrong one. Where is the region? You're right, down the bottom. Very oh, yeah, page. okay, I was right. I just said variance. It threw me off for a minute. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I move that the variance request for Rollinsford storage does not have potential for regional impact. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second by Mr. Perkins. Any discussion on the motion? The motion says that we do not have regional impact. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Okay, no, five zero. no regional impact. Discussion on the motion. Discussion on the variance. <laughs> Mr. Fredette. I think this is a prime example of a unique parcel creating a hardship. Um, I don't see a reason, as has been already discussed, that it may not even be visible and this may not even be necessary. I don't even see a reason not to grant this at all. Okay. Further discussion? Mr. Jones? I think I guess, you raise your hand up. I guess I'd like to read into the minutes the definition of a sign, <laughs> uh, if I may. Um, a sign is defined as any display of lettering, logos, or colors, lights, or illuminated neon tubes visible to the public from outside of a building or from a traveled way, which either conveys a message to the public or intends to advertise, direct, invite, announce, or draw attention to, directly or indirectly, a use, conducted, goods, products, services, or facilities available, excluding window displays and merchandise. The purpose is to promote the public health, welfare, and safety by regulating signage. Um, but it doesn't appear that it's restricted to being visible from public ways, but when you get into the actual regulations, it says any sign visible from a public way identifying or advertising an activity not located on the premises where the sign is installed. That's 1920B24. So now I'm a little confused. <laughs> well, I wonder if this is applicable. Uh, did you say traveled way or a public way? Yeah, so the definition of a sign is very broad, which is fair. It's a definition. The actual ordinance that the variance is being requested for specifically says from a public right-of-way, identifying or advertising activity. And I don't know if we can determine whether or not it's visible. It's around a bend, but I don't know what the tree cover is like or if that is relevant. Um, Ms. Crosley, what, what did the city use as a criteria to approve, to decide a variance is required? When they submitted their permit, um, we denied it for the following reasons that um, prohibited signs, so 1920 C2, prohibited signs, the following signs are prohibited in all zoning districts, 1920 C, which I apologize, this was not included in your packet. Um, this was, I don't think they did at least, that I recall. Um, 1920 C, 2F is off-premise signs. Um, the proposal is to place a sign on lot 39.3 for a business that does not operate on this lot. The business is located in Rollinsford, lot 132. Therefore, the sign is considered an off-premise sign, which is prohibited in prohibited as indicated in the above ordinance. If the sign were to be moved onto the lot where the business is located, it would be another in Rollinsford's jurisdiction. Um, where it was proposed, not something we could permit. Um, and it does continue on that we, the stance was for the size wise, just for the record. Um, if the applicant were allowed an off premise sign, they would also need relief from the ordinance. Um, the applicant is seeking 64 sque square feet of sign area in a zone that only allows for 40 square feet. That reiterates the other one. So we base it off of it being an off-premise sign is for the reason for the denial originally and told them that they needed a variance to allow for that. Okay, so the off-premise sign definition is the one that talks about it has to be visible from a public right-of-way. Um, I'm not sure whether or not that affects their square footage allowances. I'm not going to get into that. Um, but what does the board think about the applicability of the definition of off-premise sign as to this specific circumstance where it's kind of nestled in the middle of private property well not, not having a picture of it and not being able to i, I didn't drive down or know exactly where it is uh, I, I don't know i mean i would say the board should grant the variance uh, or deny the variance whatever make a decision on the variance 
Um, I mean, I don't have enough knowledge to state to go to uh, interpret the ordinance. I usually the city usually give the city a chance to give an official for and not do it at a meeting. So it's kind of tough <laughs> to put them on the spot. Um, and then the only, only comment I would add is that if we do approve it, I would just make state state the obvious that uh, it, that it has to the size has to meet the meet the uh, criteria or the uh, meet the ordinance or the requirements because their application of 64 is fair sweet the discussion of the not being in unfortunately you're all done I'm sorry all right. unless um, this the applicability about the not not meeting the sign the size is in the staff memo which isn't part of necessarily the official portion so I'm not sure what you guys think discussion mr. Brooks without arguing over whether the signs on a right away or public right away or traveled way um, I feel that it does meet the variance criteria because it is certainly a unique situation having the business located on a piece of property in another town and difficult to see from where you start to access it so it is certainly unique in this case um, I don't believe it would you know hinder any property values or any any of the other criteria I, th I think it meets a variance and I I think it'd be a cleaner thing to approve this as a variance rather than having another sign that's wishy-washy to say the least mr. Jones Dana sorry to bombard you um, any negatives for the city for approving a variance where we may not even have jurisdiction just on the off chance we do, we do no jurisdiction well if we can't regulate an off-premise sign because it's not an off-premise sign I, that's a question that I think is beyond the board but um, would granting a variance and then finding out that the variance was not needed because it doesn't meet the definition of what they're asking for is that a problem they would get to have the sign either way it sounds yeah. like I so think I agree. whether or not if the question was whether we if they needed the variance versus you still gave them the variance mm -hmm. sounds like they would still get the sign yeah so no just to just the benefit of them unless there was someone that was speaking against we didn't have anyone speak against this sign. right they, they clearly own both parcels so there's not too much in the way of a butters being affected here yeah okay that's and, all I got and it is very much a dead end so there's not other potential no through traffic yeah <laughs> Yeah, and looking at the five criteria, I, I agree. I agree with the applicant that it, it, it meets all five criteria. It, surrounding property values will not be diminished. Uh, it's not grand variance would not be contrary to the public interest. We've discussed the hardship. Um, it would do substantial justice. It would provide them a sign that's more readily visible than one that was on the actual property in, in Rollinsford. And it's not contrary to the spirit of the ordinance. It does, it's not going to change the, the nature of the neighborhood. The neighborhood, it, and it, that's what it is. There's, si there's plenty of signs already in that neighborhood. So, further discussion. Entertain a motion. Oh, sorry, Mr. Perkins. Yeah, I just think one condition should be we get something, you know, in writing from them as owners of the offsite, you know, of that lot, giving permission for this sign to be there. In case at some point these two lots have different owners so we avoid you know a discussion like we had on the first case tonight is it fair to presume that the administrative side of this would take care of that the due diligence of making sure the lot owners is indeed the same on each lot so I think Keith is indicating like an easement um, but if they're the same owner but now, in the what off about chance that years? they don't continue to both be the owners so if we even have the legal ability to do that also, you can't really grant an easement to yourself. It'd be ineffectual until the, until a new deed was written, transferring the sale. I mean, it wouldn't. I'm not asking for an ease, a easement, but <clears throat> I think we should have permission from the people who own this property in writing that the sign is allowed to be there. But they are the owner now. But I'm just saying they're two about in ten years properties. if they sell it. Well, when they sell it, then <laughs> that's a different what thing, right? When, yeah. when it sell it, yeah. sell, and then and that's up to them okay. to decide, make it happen. Yeah, and the so and and the sign permit would um, for permission wise. So the sign permit would need to be signed by the 
who the LLC, someone from the representative of the LLC, it's under John Flatley Company, I think. So he, or a representative that has authority to sign permits on behalf of the property owner. It, do, it They are different LLC, so it would just, authorization would be part of the sign permit application, yes. Um, the property owner has to sign sign permit applications. Okay. Here's a key. For the discussion. Motion. Don't all jump at once. Can I note when you read the motion language, um, please change the lot number to three. There is just lot a typo. Three. I apologize. Instead of two, it's three. Okay. okay. Mr. Brooks. After review of the application, the file, and all the information presented to the board, I feel that I, all five criteria have been satisfied due to the discussion here tonight. And I move that the request for Rollinson storage for a variance from section 1920C2F to allow an off-premises sign on a property located at 1-4 Royal Drive, Assessor's Map 39, Lot 3, be granted with the condition that it complies to the size all, of how about all other ordinance requirements. All other ordinance requirements. Fair enough. That's an easier, simpler way to say it. Yep. As applicable. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second by Mr. Perkins. So the motion is to approve it. Um, the sign. Uh, with a special condition that meets all other ordinance requirements. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Passes 5 0. Granted. Item D. Any other new business comes before the board? Any new business, Ms. Crosley? Yes. Um, so next week, a week from today, we are holding a community workshop. This will focus on um, the natural resource, its master plan. So it's going to focus on the natural resource chapter, vision, land use. This is a great opportunity for the public to come out to help us draft, um, give input to help us with drafting of those chapters and feedback for them. The master plan guides, then zoning changes. So, and those vision and land use chapters are very um, important, obviously, too, in the natural resource. So, you guys are great assets to the community and the people watching, too. We'd love to have attendees at that meeting so that we can get feedback from people so if you can come i did provide you a flyer we would love if you could register beforehand so we know how many people are coming so we can have enough copies for everyone thank you other new business coming for the board anybody i mean other new business mr Bro jones i guess just on the topic of planning um just so everyone's aware there is a kind of a tool called plan link if any of you are not on it it's kind of a great resource for figuring out these weird edge cases that uh, a lot of planners in New Hampshire get together and they kind of bounce ideas on on what's what. Um, so I can, I'm sure Dana's on it and she can probably send send that around if anyone's interested. Okay. Yes, please. Any other new business? No, that, that Chair, entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Fredette. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second by Mr. Hilton. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Please bear in mind, we do need to do the camera changing. Sit here. People at home will see you later. That's okay.